Welcome back here to Live Now from Fox, and we are in breaking news at the moment. We just got word that uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom has denied parole, is blocking parole for RFK assassin Sirhan Sirhan. There you can see his mugshot. He's 77 years old now. Of course, uh, he was charged, convicted, sentenced to the murder of Robert F. Kennedy back June 5th, 1968, sending the country really uh, into a tailspin just months after the Martin Luther King Jr. assassination. Uh, and so right now we do want to hear from California Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, Fox 2 reporter Greg Lee spoke to him just hours before he made this decision uh, and was asked about what he was thinking in the lead up to his decision today. And I know you're saying in a couple hours we're going to get. Yeah, I can't. I... And you don't have to give me the decision. But I'm just curious <laughs> if you can give us some insight into what. Yeah. Th this was not an easy decision. This was yeah. not. I have a, I'm calling just for the purposes of, of I'm not obfuscating or even trying to yeah. deflect. I have uh, at 115, I'm calling a number of the family members, which I pledged to do before I told anyone of that decision. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a weighty decision. Every week I make these decisions. Every single week. Uh, dozens and dozens of people come in uh, from the vetted by my staff, uh, victims' statements. I read every single one of these files. I remember, and it's neither here nor there, it may not be important or interesting to anybody, but I remember and never forget, I was on a Southwest airline flight. I walked in, and, and there was Governor Brown sitting uh, in the middle seat, and the plane was just getting bored. And I said, why are you in the middle seat? He said, and he had two large files on his left and the right of both seats. So that's why he's in the middle seat. And I said, what, what, are, what, what are you reading? He goes, this is the toughest part of the job that no one talks about, is going through paroles. It's hard. And it was all the parole files. I just remember that. And I sort of quizzically walked by and said, well, see you later, Governor. Good luck. Let's talk about homelessness and housing and education. And then I became governor. And the first week, I get those same files. It was difficult. Every week since, it becomes even more difficult. And this is one of them. And obviously this one's more impactful because it has an impact around the rest of the world. It's impactful because it had a direct impact on 11 family members, 11 children of Robert Kennedy. Uh, it changed the course of history. Uh, and it's a big part of my own personal history in terms of my own, um, you know, my own aspirations, the things that inspired me as a child, inspired my family, the Shriver family in particular, inspiring my dad, my dad inspired by Bobby Kennedy himself. So all of that is part and parcel of this decision. It's hard. Um, it was not done lightly. The last day to do it is tomorrow, and I think that gives you an indication. I didn't wait to wait for any other purpose than there was a weightiness to this, including finally when I personally went and I reviewed the archives uh, and saw the gun and read through the diaries, Sir Han, um, and looked at all the evidence of this case. Uh, we took this to a whole nother level of consideration. It was weighed on you for sure. Yeah. Okay, so really interesting uh, to hear Governor Gavin Newsom's thought process uh, as he made this decision uh, today. Uh, joining me on the phone, uh, yet again, former federal prosecutor uh, and legal expert, Doug Burns. Uh, Doug, do you still have us? Really interesting to hear yeah. uh, Governor Newsom's uh, thinking behind all this, quite methodical, uh, quite long as well, as he uh, really struggled to make this decision today. Well, he was making a few points, and they were good ones. You know, number one, he did recognize, of course, how could you not? You know, this is a very noteworthy uh, parole application situation, you know, given the, you know, notoriety. But then he made a key point, and that is that, you know, day-to-day -day cases are just as important, you know, to the particular family members involved and so on. So I like the way he put that. Um, so in other words, what I'm trying to say, it's interesting, is that, you could try to argue, I suppose, you know, every case, you know, merits the same consideration, which is true, but we are human beings after all. And so when you get something, you know, with this much notoriety, it's a little different. But I take the governor at face value. Obviously, he put a lot of, you know, thought and consideration into it. He went back into archives and, and, and things like that. Um, and I think uh, largely I think he made the right decision, actually. <clears throat> Yeah, and I just want to bring up some of the points we were previously mentioning, but um, the parole board uh, in August of last year 
recommended that Sirhan Sirhan be eligible uh, for parole. Uh, and of course, uh, this was after 15 tries by his legal team, and they denied that. Uh, but now Governor Newsom is essentially uh, not following through with the recommendation uh, from that board. Is that unusual? Is that customary? Have you seen that before? No, it's unusual. Uh, it's not to say that it doesn't happen. Of course it does, because when there are many, many parole decisions that a governor, a chief executive, can either ratify or overrule, go the other direction, you know, for the most part, you're going to see them follow it on the logic that, after all, these are the experts, they know the file, you know, better than me, ostensibly. Uh, but at the same time, you will see situations where the executive will do exactly what was done today, which is, you know, go against the recommendation. You know, the law, the statutes are pretty clear. Uh, they specifically say that, you know, the parole board makes the recommendation, but it's the chief executive who has the final say. So, you know, that's uh, a piece of legislation, obviously, that calls for different roles uh, for different entities, the parole board on the one hand and then the chief executive of the state on the other. Um, so while it's unusual, I'm not surprised in this situation. As you pointed out, Andrew, I mean, the man was denied parole 15 times. Um, he just cold-bloodedly assassinated a major national leader who was about to ostensibly get the nomination for president. Um, again, back to the point I made about the governor, that's really no different from a human standpoint than anybody else being killed in terms of their family and so on. But again, history tells us that in you know, very you know, high-profile political assassinations, for example, you don't see a lot of you know, mercy thrown around is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, and of course, uh, we had been discussing as well the um, public uh, disagreements between uh, Robert F. Kennedy's surviving children, and I believe there are nine surviving children, uh, and, and his widow is also still with us, Ethel Kennedy. Very public uh, displays. Uh, on the one side, you have uh, son Douglas Kennedy, uh, who told the parole panel that Sirhan was worthy of compassion and love. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, his oldest, wrote to the panel urging that Sirhan be freed, citing his impressive record of rehabilitation. Those were just two of the most high-profile, uh, I guess, supporters of this uh, parole recommendation. And then, of course, you had other children urging Newsom to block the release. And I thought it was interesting that Newsom did say he was going to call some of the children before he made that decision today. Yeah, I did. I hear, heard that. Um, I mean, look, again, obviously you don't need me to lay out that you can argue something like this in two directions. Um, I would note, though, that it's always very, very difficult to be sure, you know, that somebody, and I'm not even talking about Sirhan Sirhan per se, you know, that any particular offender, you know, is rehabilitated now because then the worst nightmare, and this factors into the back of their minds as well, and there's nothing wrong with it, which is, you know, God forbid, could there be a situation where an offender, again, not necessarily this one, would then just go out and reoffend right away? And, you know, boy, that's going to put a lot of egg on our faces and so on and so forth. So you can never be sure. So the arguments are very simple. You can argue earnestly and in good faith. Look, based on everything we know and see and have observed for decades and decades and decades, this man, this offender, is rehabilitated. We don't think he's going to harm anybody else, you know, and therefore... We support him being released. And then the counter-argument is twofold, which is, A, the point I just made, which is how can you be so sure, but then, B, just that the crime itself essentially warrants imprisonment for the rest of his life. I mean, and again, you can argue that in different directions. But back to your observation from the family standpoint, I think it is very interesting, um, almost fascinating, to see that two offspring of Robert uh, Fitzgerald Kennedy uh, would promote this particular individual being released. I find that very, very unusual. I want to take our viewers back to June 5th, 1968. Uh, we were mentioning Robert F. Kennedy had just won the California primary for the Democratic presidential nomination. Uh, later that year, the election, the 1968 election, Lyndon Johnson uh, was not seeking re-election. And of course, uh, we know, uh, ushering in the uh, presidency of Richard Nixon. Uh, but Sirhan has consistently said he doesn't recall shooting Kennedy. He wounded five others that night in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. But he told the parole commissioners that he takes responsibility. 
killing a man he called, quote, the hope of the world. He was initially sentenced to death, but that sentence was commuted to life when the California Supreme Court briefly outlawed capital punishment in 1972. Uh, he's of Jordanian ascent, uh, descent, rather. Uh, and so if he did get parole, uh, it kind of makes you wonder if he would have been deported back to Jordan. Well, his brother um, said that he could reside with him. You know, that's always an important practical factor. Wait a minute, where is this person going to live, reside after all of these years? So the brother said he could live with him and they could live out their remaining days. But then, to your point, um, very much in play, the possibility that he would be deported out of the United States of America, absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, I'm also kind of curious as well, you know, for many people uh, who remember that day quite vividly and what it meant for the country uh, at this point in time, um, and I haven't spoken to them, but uh, I can imagine that they would be quite shocked uh, that this was even up for consideration, considering the political turmoil it really sent the country into. Most people, I think you're right, and I think you're speaking for the majority of the people, if you're talking about a poll or a consensus, I mean, most people would say for that offense, um, in our opinion, and we're not, you know, lawyers or legal experts, people on the street would say, you know, my opinion is that he should serve out the rest of his life in prison. I mean, that's not an unreasonable position at all. I think that part of this recommendation by the parole board, and again, I'm not even saying, I'm not saying this negatively at all, is, you know, a little bit of changing times. It's certainly, you could get into an academic seminar and debate all day long, a good one, about the positive aspect of trying to talk about rehabilitation and so forth. But, you know, this just ain't the case to do it in <laughs> with a guy who killed Robert Fitzgerald Kennedy, who was about to win the nomination for president in 1968. I mean, you talk about backstories real quick. It's actually very interesting. I know uh, the history buffs know this, but we'll just make it clear. I mean, Lyndon Johnson served out, you know, less than half of John F. Kennedy's term because chronologically he was killed in 63. So then he ran for re-election in 64 and he won in a huge landslide. Mm -hmm. But he was entitled, uh, authorized to run again. And of course, shockingly, LBJ, um, you know, very, very took it really hard about what was going on with the Vietnam War to his credit. Uh, but he shocked everybody back then. You know, I'm not running again in 68. So there came his nemesis, right? Robert Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson weren't exactly going to have Thanksgiving dinner together. Okay? They did not like each other at all, as all the history books teach us. And so the point is, now emerges you know, this sort of enemy and nemesis of LBJ. It was kind of a fascinating storyline. you know. And then all of a sudden, boom, he gets assassinated. And as you said, also in terms of Martin Luther King, I mean, those were extremely turbulent times, 1968. Yeah, and um, just back to Sirhan Sirhan as well. He was 24 years old uh, when he committed right. this murder. Uh, he, uh, like I said, uh, he was a Jordanian. Uh, he was uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, advocating for the rights of Christian Palestinians. He was fed up with the conflict uh, in the Middle East. Of course, that persists uh, in many, you know, different iterations, but also similar ones to this day. Uh, and so this was, uh, you know, a political assassination, uh, and now he's 77 years old. He's denied parole. Uh, Doug, thanks for being with us. Just your final thoughts on this. No, my final thoughts is that it's a very, very interesting call that Governor Newsom made. I think it was a tough one, as he himself described it. There were some factors in Sirhan Sirhan's uh, favor, but at the end of the day, I believe he made the correct decision today. All right, Doug Burns, legal expert, former federal prosecutor, we always appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your day. My pleasure. You too. Thank you.